Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Cats Chats and 88 Keys. We are as empty as we've ever been here. It's just me and Gabby in the room. Christmas time, I guess. And uh, housemates have gone home for Christmas. I know that Bobby K, uh, maestro that is, is watching in Poland. Uh, hello, mate. How are you doing? Gabby is single-handedly doing about three people's jobs here. She's zooming in, zooming out. She's running the desk. And we've even set up a little cat cam for you, which hopefully uh, will give you some action every now and then. All the cats are in the room uh, and they're feeling rather frisky, which is always good news. I know that as soon as I start playing, Tiller's going to leave because she's not having any of it. But the lads, who knows? I've got four pieces for you this evening. They are fairly indulgent pieces, I think it would be fair to say. It's Christmas time. It's no, no, uh, there's never an excuse at Christmas for doing things by halves. And so I just wanted to pick four absolute gems um, for you. But to be honest, I'd say at least three of them won't necessarily be that well known to you. And indeed, one of the composers, the first piece that I'm going to play, I'd never heard of uh, until a couple of weeks ago when I discovered this work. 2020 has been a tricky year for everyone, and obviously for some people more than others. And I wanted to just play pieces that I thought, as vaguely as possible anyway, could try and give us some catharsis from some of the ups and downs of the year and also can give us reason to be optimistic, have something to hang on to, some hope for the future. Um, this first piece by Sergei Bortkiewicz um, is sort of a, a, a diptych. Um, so it's two pieces in one. He wrote several of these, Lamentations and Consolations. And what's clever is that he's written them both in the same key centre. So they're both in the key centre of D. But the first one, the Lamentation, unsurprisingly, he puts in the minor. And the second one, the Consolation, he puts into D major. And this was a man who was no stranger to hardship in his life. He had the very unenviable position of being persecuted by both communists in Russia and Nazis in Germany in the one lifetime. Um, the communists in Russia around the time of the revolution forced him to leave, to flee. Um, and eventually via a long trip via Turkey and Israel, he ended up in Austria. Um, he settled there and then moved to Berlin. Uh, and soon after the Nazis turned up and he started being prosecuted for his Russian, uh, persecuted, sorry, for his Russian background. Uh, he then fled back to Austria and lived a very uh, destitute, miserable life. And it wasn't until finally after the war that he began to get the recognition that he deserved and, and managed to find some kind of real satisfaction in his arc and his journey. So if that isn't an inspiring story for us all to hang in there and, and keep plugging away, then I don't know what is. Um, There'll be another little theme hanging over tonight as well. Um, a couple of days ago, our longest serving housemate, Anna, who's been with us for three years, uh, moved out um, to move in with her boyfriend. And that's obviously been a real feeling of sadness and loss as well as joy. And so that's why, one, that's a very personal reason, but there are many reasons I'm sure for all of you why there's very bittersweet moments going on right now, it being Christmas time and the, the uh, amount of available contact with loved ones being what it is. So to hopefully ease some of that pain, I have four of these lovely pieces for you and I'm gonna start with Lamentation and Consolation by Sergei Borutkiewicz. Thank you. 
consolation is so lush, so kind of almost indecently schmaltzy after such a cold and, and isolated and lonely lamentation. Gabby, if there was ever any doubt that you truly are the cat whisperer, it's been put to bed today. Cats are just there, pride of place. Even Tinto's come for a little cuddle. Marvellous. Um, okay, cool. So that was a kind of, maybe a kind of general scene setter or, or mood setter. I think the one thing I would say is in common with all the pieces I'm going to play tonight is they all start fairly subdued and then work themselves into one hell of a climax. And I think that's probably more true in the next two uh, than in the others, but, but for all of them, it's, it's definitely the case. This next one is definitely the most overtly positive of the works tonight and um, the one which I think I wanted to make the most personal attachment to. Um, Liszt composed this as part of his set of works called The Years of Pilgrimage, which were inspired by his European travels. Um, and the, the, this book is called Italy and the next book is called Switzerland. And uh, he takes in all kinds of inspiration from art to poetry to landscape. Uh, and this is called Sposalizio, which um, means the marriage. And he was very much inspired by Raphael's painting um, uh, of Mary the Virgin. Um, sorry, the marriage of the Virgin. And... Um, there's several things that he has in his writing here that really evokes the feeling of, of bells and, and matrimony and, and weddings, if you like. So first of all, in terms of generally getting the feeling of bells, he's doing something called uh, using a lot of pentatonic writing or writing in, in the pentatonic mode. The most simple way to explain that is just that it's all the black notes on the piano. <laughs> hear if I play the first two bars immediately how and all this is at the beginning is kind of a, a basic kind of wash of sound and a little bit of a scene setter before the more motivic material starts. So right from the start we're plunged into this warm hazy but bell-like world and for those of you who know the works of the French Impressionist composers, Debussy, Ravel, you'll hear just how progressive Liszt was. Um, we're still in the, in the very middle of the 19th century at this point, but the, the exploration that he's, he's embarking upon in terms of treating uh, harmony as colour rather than purely as, as uh, structural or form-based purposes is pretty extraordinary. And what's amazing is that that very simple, innocent uh, introduction is the piece. It's, um, it sometimes is an accompaniment, it sometimes is a melody. Um, for example, when we start building to quite a big climax on the second page, it moves from accompanimental to something much more substantial. up and engulfs the right hand and at the massive climax at the very end of the piece the right hand is doing a, a, a glorious uh, rendition of this of this kind of wedding march theme which I'll play you in a second while the left hand is cascading down the piano in parallel octaves of that same pentatonic shape and the the roar of sound at that point is pretty remarkable so much so that when we were doing the sound test earlier we had to to tweak the mics to a, to a level we hadn't had to ever put them to before, just to make sure that they could cope with the amount of power and resonance that Liszt is evoking at that point. So after the first section, which I just played you the end of, um, the music stops quite suddenly, and Liszt introduces this, like I say, a sort of wedding march inspired theme. But what's amazing about it is that he marks it triple piano. So when I tell you that piano is quiet and pianissimo is very quiet, Triple piano is very unusual. We don't see it much in music and certainly not much before uh, the Romantic era. 
Um, and so it's as if from another world. He marks it dolcissimo, very sweetly, and it's full of spread chords and harmonies that start very, very simple and become much more lush and indulgent. on playing forever it's it's so it's so touching um, <clears throat> so then when we reach, reach the big climax which I'm not going to spoil by playing for you a little bit now um, the right hand is playing that melody but double forte right at the top of the piano and as I say the left hand is perorating around it with these cascading octaves uh, an incredible incredible feeling there are two um, personal associations for this piece really uh, one of which is that I knew about it sort of obliquely, um, but it didn't really come to my attention until Katie, one of our housemates uh, who plays piano as well, was fooling around a few weeks ago, discovered it in one of my books and, and started learning it. And I thought, wow, that's a bit special. I must crack on with that. Uh, and the second more, more even more touching um, association I wanted to make was, you know, as I said, there's a sort of general theme of tonight's concert and, and we've been going through a, a lot of heartache um, the last few weeks uh, preparing for Anna's departure because three years is a long time and when you live with people, you hopefully, you know, the right people and, and, the, and the, with the right spirit, you build up a, um, an incredible bond. And so losing Anna, losing Anna to the house, she's only gone to Chiswick, Losing Anna to the house has been a very sad process these last few weeks, but it's been imbued with so much joy because Gabby and I always uh, joked to each other that the only time people are allowed to move out of this house is for love. And that is exactly what Anna has done. Um, and she, she met Tiago while she was living here and it's been our unbelievable pleasure to watch their love bloom and now to have seen them in their new place and, and, and wish them every um, ecstasy and joy that a, that a beautiful partnership can bring. So for you, Anna and Tiago, I would love to play Liszt's Sposalizio.
for those of you who remember the the other list work I played a long time ago in first lockdown in the should we say the more pared back version of these concerts uh, Benediction de Dieu dans la solitude um, his use of harmony in that piece is very very similar to what he's doing there and he's a, a, in the same kind of key areas as well lots of sharps in the key signatures and I think what we feel is well in Benediction de Dieu undoubtedly because of the devout uh, subject matter we feel a, an incredible religious ecstasy and I think it's not too dissimilar what he's going for there as well um, these kind of heavenly roars of sound and, and being utterly overwhelmed by by the spirits. I just thought it was very interesting how he he uses such similar harmonies and such similar colours for those two pieces. Okay, some Shimonovsky. For those of you who don't know Shimonovsky very well, he's probably the B-side to Chopin, and that is certainly not taking anything away from Shimonovsky. Rather, how could anyone be anything other than the B-side to Chopin? Uh, Szymanowski was a Polish composer kicking around mainly in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and ever since I discovered his music a long time ago, uh, more on that in a, in a minute, um, I've always found it utterly overwhelming. Two, two aspects really that I enjoy most about it. One is his harmonic language. Um, never exactly takes you where you're expecting and so there's always interesting colorations and harmonizations of uh, melodies that you would expect to be done in a more I don't know traditional predictable way and also his treatment of the piano as only ever an enormous orchestral force um, is an absolute delight as well um, and particularly when playing his chamber music, which I've done a lot of, you know, when you're playing with, therefore, a solo line, like a violin, um, to create this orchestral wash around is, is something that's incredibly pleasing. So there are always lots of notes in Chimanovsky, but one should hear very few of them, I guess, is the, is the message. And when we build to the climax here, it is, it's huge. I mean, the list is huge, but it's huge in a very kind of, pianistic way. He's writing in a very kind of uh, a clear way for the instrument. Szymanowski is writing only thinking about the orchestral sounds. Um, to show you a little bit what I mean about the harmonies, I might just play the opening, the first melody, and I might just linger on a couple of chords that are not quite maybe the harmonic colour that one might expect. He's constantly diverting us down pathways that we're not expecting at all. Um, rather, to, to carry on this sort of general theme, or, or one of the themes of tonight, this is, this is a very sad piece. It's marked Condolore, with sadness. And there's a trudging heaviness to the left-hand accompaniment. that the right hand has a, a, a hard job escaping. Like all the pieces tonight, I promised you, it builds to an almighty climax with roaring scales in the left hand. Um, but it's what happens at the end, which I think is, is most touching and why I think it also suits tonight's concert very well, is that this is not a cheerful piece. It is doom and gloom and, and a kind of frustrated passion throughout. But literally 20 seconds before the end, and entirely unprepared, we flip suddenly into the major, which we've not really had any suggestion that we were that interested in before then. And so from all of this, it finally feels as if, well, either we're cried out or shouted out, and the catharsis means our race is run and we've found some peace. Um, or, 
we found some solace of comfort and hope for a better future. Um, I wanted to dedicate this to my old maka Mihal. Um, it is thanks to you that I know Shimonovsky's music that, that I do know as well as I do. And um, it has been the pleasure of a lifetime to play his violin works with you and to commune, to allow our souls to co-mingle in so doing. Um, one of the many sadnesses of this year has been the lack of contact we've had. And I play this to you as a, a beacon of hope and positivity and love for a fresh start and reconnections the other side of New Year. Love you, Matty. Thank you.
nice music. It's pretty good. Uh, I'm going to finish tonight with uh, an arrangement of a Negro spiritual. Um, the spiritual is Deep River. And the arrangement is by Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who was himself descended from slaves. And now, Negro spirituals in and of themselves are incredibly fascinating. Um, when the slave owners took the slaves over, uh, kidnapped them to, to, their, to the slave owner's home, um, they did the best they could to ban and crush the, any pre-existing culture that might have existed. Um, so, you know, talking was forbidden uh, in anything other than the local language. Um, shared reminiscences, um, any kind of common ground that the slaves might have had with each other was, was stamped out as much as was possible. And of course, they were indoctrinated into the religion of the slave owners. And from this came their response, if you like, or, or, or comfort, let's say. So within this initially foreign religion, they started to build their own communities around that and to derive their own strength from that. And these songs started to emerge, which had many, many different meanings. Uh, in fact, many of you hopefully will remember the Margaret Bonds piece um, that I played a few months ago, Troubled Water, which had a very similar, um, which was also based on a Negro spiritual. And uh, there were hidden meanings contained within these. So the slaves would sing these when they were in the fields and they would seem harmless enough. They're certainly very devout songs, but coded within them were references to escape. Um, so they might be references to the underground movement, which was helping slaves escape. Uh, they might be specific references to how one might escape. So in this work, Deep River, um, the river is quite an important one, uh, quite an important reference. Now, you could say that crossing the river um, over into Jordan is a, is a biblical reference. But of course, you could also say that crossing the river might be the best way to safety or that crossing the river was the best way to mean that the dogs chasing you couldn't pick up your scent. So there's an incredible, there are, there are incredible layers to these pieces and they are also imbued with such strength, uh, such resilience in their sound and in the way that they were sung. Um, that is frankly overwhelming given what the protagonists were going through at the time. Um, so just to give you a little whiff of this, before I play it, I want to play you a little 30 second snippet of, of the original or of the original as a song. And if you like this, I've included a link to it in the description uh, underneath the video so you can check out the full clip at your leisure. But I just thought so you could get this, 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 the singing is so rich and burnished and strong and noble. And we as humble pianists must try and embody that, but one can only come so close. So I wanted to give you a little taster of it. stuff. Um, so this is the same tune that I'm going to be playing um, with uh, a more kind of urgent, passionate middle section that brings us to a big climax 
and then the tune comes back one last time. The, the emotion is, is absolutely dripping with almost every note and the, the lush, wonderful chromatic harmonizations that Coleridge Taylor has, has deployed here is, is a joy to behold. Really, I'll also just read you the words quickly. Uh, Deep River, my home is over Jordan. Deep River, Lord, I want to cross over into camp ground. Here we go.
Well, if anything should give us reason to feel inspired, that should. To write such music full of love, hope, camaraderie, belief, strength. Under arguably the worst conditions humans have ever been put through. Uh, is very humbling. And in these difficult times, may it serve to remind ourselves of what we have and to know that we're stronger than we think we are. Boring business, but kind of important. If you've been enjoying the concert, if you have enjoyed the concert, please do consider buying a ticket. There are links in the YouTube and Facebook descriptions. Uh, it's super simple through PayPal. There's no set price, so it's whatever you can spare. And given that this is the only way I have of concertizing for, I would say, at least the next three to six months, and has been for the last nine months, it would mean a huge amount to me personally. I would like to give a huge thank you to Gabby, who, as aforementioned, has run literally the job of three people tonight. Um, and the first time she'd done the most important one of those jobs uh, was tonight. So double whammy on that. Not that it's a massive surprise. Her being the supremely incredible human being that she is. <laughs> She's swearing at me in the background. Um, and that's about it. Um, I'm, I'm off for Christmas. We'll be back on New Year's Day. Now, New Year's Day is going to be a big one. I'm not going to give too much away. But there is import to the event. And this is going to be backed up with a blinding piece of music. Um, so that's hopefully something that's going to banish the January blues for you all. Until then, have a wonderful Christmas. Stay safe. Uh, it's not easy right now. Um, but uh, the end, hopefully, is coming a little closer day by day. Thank you so much for watching. It's been, as ever, an absolute delight to play for you. And tune in next time. All the best.